Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of our case review session, which is going to be comparing or contrasting different AI tools when they come across real-life case scenarios. And I think it's very important as physicians nowadays to know what strengths or weaknesses and capabilities different AI tools have when you're using them to help you. And these videos are designed to help you make the best choice and find what's best for you and how go about it. I'm not sponsored by any of these companies. This is a completely independent analysis, okay? And I'll just show you in real time how these this specific case was ran through these four different tools, Gemini 2.0, Valash, Grok3, ChatGPT 4.0, and Manas AI. All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is an 82-year-old female, comes to the ED, acute chest pain at 4 a.m. She does tell you that about a week, she's been having a left-sided chest pain that gets worse when she lays on her left side. She, and she tells you that she's progressively losing her exercise tolerance. You look at her history, she got DVT, she's on Eliquis, she has insulin-dependent diabetes, hypertension, and CKD3. No family history and social history, basically, just lives independently. The medications, Eliquis, insulin, metformin, and alcinopril. And on exam, vital signs, she's hacky. Blood pressure is 100 to 130s over 70. Respiratory rate 18 to 22. Oxygen saturation is 95%. On two liters, EKG shows sinus tachycardia. In physical exam, comfortable neck, no JVD. There's some distant heart sounds, no murmurs. Diminished posterior breath sounds, no crackles. Abdomen soft, non tender. Extremities just one plus pitting edema to the mid chins bilaterally and neurologically intact. The findings were creatinine was 2.1, up from her baseline, 1.3, BUNS 46, and BNP of 1070. She also had elevated D-dimer, well, I'll show you here, 1200. Her tropes were up to 23, decreased to 14, and her CBC was just normocytic anemia, no leukocytosis, and LFTs were normal, and this is the D-dimer being elevated. The dark blue is the hair D-dimer, the other blue is the reference range of D-dimer, okay? So imaging, they did a chest x-ray AP view that showed enlarged cardiac silhouette and ruled out any consolidation, pneumothorax or large effusion. And okay, what do you guys think? Pause the video here. Think about your differential diagnosis that you want to have. And let's go through. The answer is this patient came with a signs of leading to an early pericardial tamponade. So we're going to go over how each of these tools went through. And we're going to start with Gemini. So I gave the case to Gemini, as you can see, kind of a, a quick summary. You can see there's no imaging or actual EKGs in here. So that means it's going to believe what we tell it, right? Like if I say enlarged cardiac silhouette, but but there's other things on the x-ray that personally or the radiologist who reads it doesn't say it, then that piece of data is left out. So that's what you need to know about every AI tool. If you don't give them the correct input, okay, it's going to assume that is the only finding. This is an algorithm. It's going to miss, okay? All of them are like this. You need to give them the most amount and most specific and detailed amount. And right now, a lot of these tools are not able to analyze imaging. So it's very important to read your imaging yourself and get trained and be better and reading your own images. Now, Gemini talked about this narrative of, oh, there's a concerning presentation of an elderly woman. She has some comorbidities. And they started creating a differential diagnosis about, I think, five of them. And it did consider the first top of its lane was the acute decompensant heart failure, then pericardial effusion, possible tamponade, ACSP, and aortic dissection. Now, it did go through what it was thinking for each of these and then why it considered it. So, for example, for the effusion, she said there is a left side chest pain worsening by laying on the left side and distant heart sounds suggesting of pericardial effusion. The enlarged cardiac silhouette on chest x ray further supports this. And then it did say that while she doesn't have overt signs of tamponade, like the pulses paradoxes or signaling with hypertension, the tachycardia could be a compensatory mechanism. So pretty good in terms of the narrative of the top differential diagnosis. It does still miss a few things, right? So we're going to go over that. In terms of diagnostic workup, it talks about the ECG, the echo, and how important it is to get it right away, serial cardiac enzymes, the D-dimer, and the CTA. And it does tell you to get an ABG and a renal ultrasound, which are, again, very important and to get. And those are on top of the you know, workup for your differential diagnosis that you need. And it does give you some initial therapies, but as you can see, it's pretty non-specific. It just says diuretics, possible, if heart failure suspected. So it just halts there with some of the possibilities that you would like to treat. 
Next one is Grok 3, right? We gave the same scenario to Grok 3, and it, the first differential for it was pericarditis. It just it talk, did talk about pain, given chest pain worsened by laying on the left side, distant heart sounds, and potential pericardial effusion. And then it gave some possible etiologies, pericardial effusion. It did talk about that enlarged syllabus. Did a good job, then heart failure, then PE, MI, pneumonia, and pleural effusion, aortic dissection. Okay, no misdiagnosis there. So seven differentials. Did talk about how urgent it is to get an echo, EKG, chest CT, renal function, thyroid function. So it didn't really go into renal ultrasound or anything. It just wants to see these first. And then it gave you a little more detailed treatment. So it said if it's pericarditis, I want you to do this. Consider the CKD sets to be avoided if you can, if there's no contraindication, anticoagulation consideration. It's set to continue for DVT history unless the PE is ruled out and bleeding risk increases. So it didn't really help here. There's no risk benefit analysis, but it did talk about it. And these are some basic things. The next one is the Manis description, which I'll tell you, it did a really good job here. It did. It was a very good pinpoint first top of the line diagnosis, pericardial fusion with possible early tamponade, which is what really was happening here. So all of these supporting evidence are there. Acute decompensator heart failure was the second. Acute pericarditis was third. Uremic pericarditis was considered because of the AKI, which is cool, but how lucky is it? And then the next one was ACS. But I'll show you that other than these, that was in the summary kind of version, they also generated the very detailed comprehensive kind of case summary and then all of these with more and more details. Got the pericardial fusion tamponade, a lot of reasoning, diagnostic priority, therapeutic priority, so very detailed on how to do and they actually do this by guidelines, which is very impressive. I'll post it on the website for you guys on my Patreon channel if you want to see. These are going to be all free. All the AI related videos are free for you. The summary is everything is going to be free on my website. Okay. And the last but not the least, the good old GPT-40, I have the $20 subscription and this is how it did. It really did a good job in terms of etiology and pathophysiology. Remember that I did a 10 important clinical prompts for clinicians and how to give it certain prompts to make sure that it works for you as a clinician, right? This is taking into account what how I personalize my own GPT so the format that is creating somewhat actually agrees with those clinical prompts. So it's got the etiology and pathophysiology. Again, very good job of primary concern being pericardial fusion with signs of early cardiac thaminos, very good. But as you can see, it didn't really give you more differential diagnosis. It was a lot of pinpoint diagnosis based on the findings. So the risks of missing are pretty high if you miss input some data or something that you give it is not really clinically as important and it takes it into account so it's very important that you have complete oversight on this because it's not really giving you that many differential diagnoses here but it did tell about stat bedside echo repeating therapy ekg so all the gnomis stuff in terms of that specific diagnosis is did all right so i think it did a good job as well but let's go ahead and now show you how we're going to basically break these down. So if you guys enjoyed the video to here, don't forget to subscribe and comment. This video actually took a little bit of time because as you can see, we're going to go through a comprehensive workup of these and difference between the tools. And so for you guys to really see, because if I just show you how they did it, it's not going to be more valuable. I'm going to show you how they did it and score them based on how they did. It, okay. So here is the, just a case, a complex geriatric patient. The no diagnosis that some of them missed and we're going to talk about is Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, pneumothorax. They j just took our cardiac silhouette enlarged as the only diagnosis and moved on with it. Esophageal rupture impaction was missed on a lot of the cases and I'll show you how. So if you look at this table, most of them were able to pick out ACS, aortic dissection and tamponade very importantly and as well as PE. Some of the Gemini had a brief touch on the aortic dissection and ChatGPT also had it but very brief mostly Ms. Takotsubo's manus it says implicit yes it is in the comprehensive answer but it did talk about it pneumothorax they all said no because we told them that there's nothing on x-ray 
and esophageal rupture nobody talked about or it could have been even impaction they didn't talk about those are all things that can kill your patients so i thought that would be a good so in terms of scoring them on life-threatening conditions manis gets a 5.5 then it's Grog 3 then gpt and lastly gemini flash 2 the then we're going to talk about some clinical acumen right we're going to talk about the diagnostic rate guidance adherence guideline adherence and workup thoroughness so I'll show you how each of these will do in these scenarios, right? CKD awareness, anticoagulation handling, and risk stratification, and well at teaching power and practical charting readiness. Which one is more ready for? Them? So, if you take into account all of those and score them, that actually Manus did a very good job of. He got a 98, and then I'll show you. So for diagnostic accuracy, 20 points. Guideline adherence 15, workup thoroughness 15, CKD awareness 10, anticoagulation handling 5, disposition planning 10, clarity 10, prioritization 5, safety 5, and round utility 5. So you can see here, now taking all of that into account, right? So on the first thing, diagnostic accuracy, minus 20 points, higher than others, Grok and GPT right behind, and Gemini being the last one. Remember, it's an acute decompensant heart failure. In terms of guidelines, Manus was very thorough compared against again 15. Next, Grok 3, then ChatGPT, then Gemini. Workup, again, Manus very thorough, then Grok, then GPT, actually, and Gemini pretty close. CKD awareness, all about the same except Gemini. Anticoagulation, Manus a little better than most of them. Disposition, Manus com comparatively better than both Grok and GPT and the clarity all of them were pretty clear in what they were thinking prioritization manus and gpt did a really good job safety manus gpt grok about the same and the round utility again a manus and grok but i tell you the most difference that came out of this was the diagnostic accuracy right the guideline management the workup thoroughness and disposition manus really beat all of them at this in terms of this presentation but again, as I said, I'm not sponsored. I'm just telling you what I found. And this is the score there. Manus, 98 out of 100. Grok, 3, 86 over 100. For Manus, it was very safe, fast, guideline adherent, excellent in workup and anticoagulation handling and disposition. Grok was really good in terms of CKD specific, recommended safe diuresis, generally cautious. Chat GPT, very good pattern recognition, efficient recall and relevant medical concepts. And Gemini was really good just at teaching narratives. And it got the lowest score, unfortunately. And this is just telling you all of those areas that Manus did better than all of them in terms of safety and speed, guidelines, again, comprehensive and tiered workup, superior anticoagulation handling. And at the end, I'll tell you that no AI is infallible, right? Even the top performing ones did miss a lot of the, the no misdiagnoses, and they rely on a lot on what we input. And if we miss, they're going to miss for you. So it's a very good tool for you as a clinician not to become dependent on them. Just use them for a clinical decision support and mostly like a smart scribe rather than actually trying to have them replace your human clinical judgment and oversight. So you need to have that. You need to be doing that. The action, the actionability trumps the exhaustive list, right? So if you want a broad differential is really good. And but really, what is the most actionable steps what's need to be prioritized and really managed to do a good job at this of prioritizing what to do next but again you as a clinician remember i have a video that i say why ai cannot replace you and a lot of the things that ai cannot get is the data that you get just being present in the room with a patient seeing how they act how they talk do they look anxious to you do they look like they're do your gut feeling of the situation of the patient right and you cannot put that in ai currently and even if they you put in there it's not smart enough yet to be able to analyze all of that those are very important and that video ai cannot replace you will talk about so many other reasons seven total reasons why it cannot adaptability is really important though so for these ai tools to adapt to patient specific scenarios is very important if somebody has ckd somebody has history of dvts and present with this presentation which is why i picked this case because i wanted to see not just for the current presentation, but also based on the comorbidities, which one would do better. But again, human oversight. 
very important and uh, the best ai isn't just isn't just right it's safe fast adaptable and ready to act but again with human oversight a trained clinician as you can see these all tools can miss and they are all very smart basically algorithms that require you to be in charge of how they're going to run it so they come biased they can lie and all those so if you enjoyed the video top here don't forget to comment subscribe guys this video took a little bit of time we're going to continue with these case series and compare and contrast different tools running different case scenarios and we'll try to run real case scenarios for you and the goal is for you to see which one works better for you you may not need all of the stuff that manas does you may not need gemini because you're not using it for narrative you may just need something to check clinical guidelines grok3 can do that gpt can give you the diagnosis and the buzzwords and things to help study for boards you just pick which one you need and use it at the time i'll see you guys on the next one